Hi, this week on the Heroes, Villains, and Sidekick show, we'll be looking at the origins of one of my favorite DCU characters, really in comics in general, and that character is John Constantine. And that's right, I said John Constantine. Now, I couldn't find the episode, I cannot remember which one it is, but John actually corrects someone and shows him how to pronounce his name, and he tells him his name is Constantine. So, that's what I'm going to be calling him. Now, if you know what episode that is, go ahead and go to the site and leave a message in the comments because I could not remember and I could not find out which one it is. So throughout this episode, I will be calling him John Constantine. And that's what we'll be doing here on the Heroes, Villains, and Sidekick show. We'll be learning and talking about the origins and backstories of heroes, villains, and sidekicks throughout the comic book universe and pop culture. Now we're going to look at popular characters, but we're going to also look at some of the obscure characters that you may have never heard of, but I think you'll really dig. Now, of course, since we will be going into the origins of John Constantine and, you know, a lot of his different story arcs, including what's going on with him right now, there will be spoilers in this issue. So the character of John Constantine was created by the writer Alan Moore and the artist Steve Bissett and Ja Totalbin. Now the character first appeared in the Saga of the Swamp Thing, issue 37, way back in 1985. I know I had to say way back in 1985, right? The story goes that Bissett and Totalbin were huge fans of the police and really wanted to draw uh, draw a character that resembled Sting. So Alan Moore obliged them and created the character of John Constantine the quintessential anti-hero, mage, con man, chain smoker that will always do the right thing as long as it suits his purpose. And this kind of fit with a character that Moore himself wanted to create, which was that of a wizard or a a mage, but not like we usually see like a wizened old man with the beard. He wanted a young, sort of cocky, con man type of character who was powerful in magic. And so, again, he created John Constantine. Alan Moore actually stated, quote, I have an idea that most of the mystics in comics are generally older people, very astute, very proper, very middle class in a lot of ways. They are not at all functional on the street. It struck me that it might be interesting for once to do an almost blue collar warlock. And that exa- is exactly what John Constantine is. Now I know I said that John Constantine, and I'm going to switch in between calling him John and Constantine throughout the podcast. Now some uh, sites cite John as being uh, first appearing in the Saga of the Swamp Thing, actually in issue 25. And technically, what happened was that that, uh, Bissette and Tottleman just couldn't wait. They needed to draw a character that looked like Sting. And they added uh, this one character, an extra in one of the background scenes that resembled Sting. Now, this character was later declared to be John Constantine since he bore an uncanny likeness to John when he was actually introduced in issue 37. Now, I don't believe that this background character that appeared in one panel was ever supposed to be John Constantine. I think it was just like a lot of artists do. They draw some of their favorite sort of pop culture characters in the panels. And then again, later people look back and said, oh, wait, that looks like John. That must must have been him. And again, if you look through some of the things on eBay and some of the price guides, obviously, uh, Swamp Thing 37 fetches quite a bit more than 25. So I usually look at Swamp Thing's, uh, John Constantine's first appearance is in Swamp Thing 37. It's when he says his name, he's got the quintessential uh, white shirt and the, the, the coat. So again, issue 37 of Saga and Swamp Thing is what I consider to be the first appearance of John Constantine. So let's dive into John's background and see what makes him one of the most unique characters in the DCU. Now, when Constantine was introduced in the cycle of the Swamp Thing, there was little that was really known about this cocky, dapper mystic. Uh, That's something that most people don't remember about the character. When we first were introduced to John, he was always dressed in what, you know, I can only assume was a bespoke blue pinstripe suit and a tan trench coat. And uh, he even wore white gloves sometimes. He was very much the dandy. He he dressed very well. His hair was always very well, you know, coiffed. And he was clean shaven. Now, this is much different, John, than we sort of think of when uh, we know him from his actual, his own series, where the coat's a little more tattered. He's unshaven. His hair's a mess. He looks quite disheveled. He's almost like a mystic Columbo. So John's role pretty much in the DCU when he shows up in Swamp Thing is is that of a sort of a mystical advisor to Swampy. Now in these early issues, Alec uh, Holland, the Swamp Thing, doesn't know 
really what his powers are in there. And the authors are also starting to develop and come up with these ideas of him being a plant elemental. So Constantine helps him sort of learn who he is, what he can do, just exactly how powerful he is. Because at that point, Swamp Thing has no idea. And Constantine is there as sort of a mentor, almost like a Merlin. And Constantine had a huge impact on uh, Swamp Thing's life. Uh, He's the one who helped uh, Swamp Thing realize, like I said, his true power, that he could sort of commune with the green and introduced him to the green. Uh, He actually introduced him to the Parliament of Trees. And John even let Swampy his body so that he could produce a child with his girlfriend, Abby. So, you know, Swamp Thing inhabited uh, John and uh, John and Abby conceived a child and that would go on to be one of the elementals and we're definitely going to do a Swamp Thing episode trust me because other than John Constantine and sort of Dead Man you know Swamp Thing is probably one of my well my probably my second favorite character in the DCU now <laughs> the funny thing is that one of the funniest uh, moments in these old, older Swamp Things that I loved is when uh, Swamp Thing you know he, he transports himself through the green through living um organic matter and uh he actually grows himself out of john's cigarettes because john's a pretty heavy smoker which we'll be getting into and he grows himself out of the tobacco and then while john's talking to him he sort of breaks off a piece of swamp thing and rolls it and uh, smokes it (laughs) smokes him right there it's it's really hilarious i'm actually going to put a picture of that in the uh in the show notes and due to the popularity of the character constantine was given his own series Hellblazer in 1988, and when DC launched their Vertigo Comics imprint in 93, it was made a Vertigo title. And it ended up being the longest continuously running Vertigo title uh, until it ended in issue 300 in 2011. And again, this is, like I said, this is one of my favorite characters. I can remember picking up issue one off the shelf, actually having an art class in high school and reading it and just being blown away by, you know, what they were starting to do. It was really, really cool. And, you know, one of the other coolest things about this run, you know, of John Constantine, it was a sort of an unwritten rule in the Vertigo that John never be used in the regular DCU. So no John and Batman team ups. And then the other thing that was really interesting about this character is that he aged throughout the title. Uh, and the ravages of magic show up on his face and his spirit. Although how John ages and you know the, the rate at which he ages might also uh, be due to the fact that he has some demon blood coursing through his veins thanks to the vengeance of a really pissed off demon. John is also one of the few characters in the DCU in the early years that was bisexual. Now, it was hinted in early years that the character was bisexual, but it was reaffirmed in the new Constantine the Hellblazer relaunch in 2015, where John is actively attracted to one of the new main characters and goes out on dates, and it's his boyfriend, and it's this is a really good read. We're going to get into this, uh, this 2015 relaunch later on. Um, but we see that um, Constantine is a very complex and deep character. Now, again, John was in the DCU a little bit here and there in the saga of the Swamp Things, but we really didn't learn a lot about who he was, what made him sort of the, the, the magician, the con man that he was. But we finally got to see all that in his own series. And a lot of this is due to just the amazing writing of uh, Jamie Delano. These, these first, uh, they're just incredible. Um, in doing some of the research for this podcast, I went back and, list- and listened to, right, <laughs> read uh, quite a few issues and just uh, I just could have kept going. Now, in these books, we learned that John Constantine was born in Liverpool on May 10th, 1953. I mean, we actually have the date because in one issue, he picks up a newspaper and comments, oh, it's my birthday. And that's how we're able to do some of this math with his age because we know when he was born. And since the artists do age him and the writers do age him, we can sort of put dates, uh, we can put ages on dates throughout the story. So it's it's a pretty cool thing. I mean, Spider-Man, Peter Parker, Mary Jane, all those guys, they stay the same. Um, this character aged, he grew. Um, and that's one of the things I really loved about it. Now, John's mother, Mary Ann, died in childbirth, giving birth to John and his stillborn t- twin brother. Now, Constantine was born of death. Not only did his mother die in childbirth, like I just said, but his twin brother was stillborn because John strangled him in utero with his umbilical cord. Now, John's father, Thomas, blamed the child for the death of his wife, 
but he was the one who was actually to blame. Years earlier, he had forced his wife to undergo a back alley abortion that weakened her womb, and this was the real reason that she died. But of course, she, you know, Thomas, being an alcoholic and just a, a bad person altogether, took it out on his son. John's father not being a very pleasant man, you know, him and John clashed many times, and John and his sister were, you know, forced, uh, Cheryl, her name was Cheryl, were forced to fend for themselves, uh, again, due to his father's alcoholism and, you know, on and off imprisonment. Now, at a young age, John begins to dabble in magic. He doesn't quite realize it, but magic is in his family line, the laughing magician. This goes back ages and ages so he has a knack for this and his first successful uh, act of magic uh, he actually took all his childhood innocence and vulnerability which he of course sees as weakness and he locks it away he locks that part of himself away and this could really be the first act that really makes him you know the hardened jaded cynical sort of con man me first person uh, as he grows into of course later in the 60s before he runs away from home he actually puts a curse on his father that sort of withers the man and you know it didn't it wasn't supposed to do that but it made him frail and withered john stops the uh, curse before it kills him but he runs away from home he just can't take it anymore and of course john travels throughout the uk and uh, finally settles in london where he meets francis Chaz chandler now, Chaz will go on to become one of John's closest friends and out-survives pretty much all his friends in the end. Now, see, people have a nasty way of dying in John's company. And in many cases, he's the one who ends up being directly responsible for their deaths. Now, even though his friends have a nasty habit of dying, they don't quite leave his side. They actually follow him around like ghosts. It's a really sad sort of macabre posse that he hangs with. There's, you know... Uh, a biker guy, there's a nun, there's a bunch of his friends, and they sort of just stick around and remind him of all the mistakes uh, that he's made that have caused their deaths. Now, one night in the mid 70s, or early 70s actually, John happens about the Roxy Club and sees the Sex Pistols, and he falls in love with punk music. Now, on a side note, I would have loved to be at that show as well. So. John decides to cut his long hair, spike it up, and along with Chaz as his roadie, a drummer named Bino, and his mate Gary Lester, they form a punk band called Mucus Membrane. I know, pretty gross, right? Mucus Membrane. Uh, very punk, though. Very, very 70s punk. Uh, and let's just say they were, they were pretty awful. But John was having a blast, and all was right with the world. Now, it was on one of the band's concert, concert tours where John first tries to apply his skills as a mage, sort of in a heroic act, but that goes horribly wrong. And while at the Casanova Hotel in Newcastle, which is a, a place that comes up quite often in early Constantine before we learn about this, um, so at this hotel in Newcastle, the band comes across a magical orgy, like one does, uh, where all the participants uh, have been just massacred by a demon. Now. They didn't summon the demon, but a child, the child in Fort that they were abusing during the ritual, uh, she called the demon forth to take revenge on these people. Uh, and now it was out of control. Now John is always cocky, and uh, he convinced the rest of the crew that they could fix things by summoning their own demon to destroy the one that the little girl did, Astra. And uh, they did. Unfortunately, they didn't possess the skill to properly control the demon. And when they summoned it, after it killed the demon that Astra brought forth, uh, it turned on the group and it started torturing John's friends and, you know, just, you know, gonna, it was going to kill them all. Now, before it can do any of that, John does some of his fancy footwork, but before he could really save everyone, the demon escaping back to hell pulls Astra, the little girl, along with him and... Now, this is a pretty, this is a pretty, you can see why John is having nightmares from this. You know, the demon's dragging Astra to hell. John is holding on to one of her arms. And, of course, the portal closes and John is left, you know, just holding on to the damned girl's severed arm. You know, it's pretty gruesome. She was, you know, an innocent person dragged to hell. It was John's fault. And, you know, here he is left over this arm left. And, uh... It was pretty freaky, and it, it freaked him out. And this is the kind of stuff that, 
you know, was in these Vertigo titles that, you know, you aren't going to see, you know, in Spider-Man and Batman and, you know, the regular, you know, universes, but Vertigo really could do this stuff. And uh, it really, I remember reading these at the time, it was, these just, just blow me away. Now, John's life, you know, spirals out of control at that point, and he ends up in Raven's Scar Psychiatric Hospital. Quite the creepy name for a psychiatric hospital, Raven's Scar, but that's where he ends up. And he spends the next few years in and out of there, hoping to you know, regain some balance in his life. And uh, this whole era, before we learned about Newcastle, was very mysterious. Uh, he would allude to it, uh, and he even showed up in an early uh, issue of Sandman. And after he helped the Dream King find some missing uh, sort of accoutrement of his own, uh, John actually asked him for a favor to like end the nightmares from Newcastle. So it's one of the first times we started hearing about Newcastle and what did that mean. And when we really found out about it in these issues, uh, it really, you know, it was really worth it. It, it really paid off. So throughout the years, again, these are 300 issues and he is aging during this. But throughout the years, John comes in contact with just all kinds of baddies, uh, all kinds of demons, angels, uh, lords of hell, even the king of the vampires. And throughout all these exploits, John loses friends and family. Uh, but he doesn't lose them for good because, like I said, a lot of them haunt him and remain behind. Of course, the one person that does make it through most of this is Chaz. Uh, he is one of his constant friends. Now, we haven't talked about this that much, but John is a bit of a smoker. In fact, uh, it's actually told that, it, you know, in one of the issues or whatnot, that he smokes up to 30 silk cut cigarettes a day. Uh, now, I made the mistake of smoking a little bit. And if you've ever smoked, I want to, you got to know that that is a lot of cigarettes. Uh, well, all those cigarettes cut up with John when he was in his 40s, uh, and he contracted lung cancer. And if you had seen the movie with Keanu Reeves, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, you can see where this was part of the storylines for that movie. So in the comic book, John in his 40s, you know, contracted lung cancer. Now, not wanting to be damned to hell because he knew that's where he was going, and he had a lot of enemies there, John came up with a plan to save his hide. Now, the first of the fallen was a major lord of hell, and he had it out for John from other things John had done to him in some earlier issues. And John sold his soul to him and to the other lords of hell. So there were three lords of hell. He sold his soul to all of them. Now, when the Lords of Hell realized this, they knew that if one of them were to try to claim his soul, you know, all hell, you know, you know, say to all hell would break out in hell. And so instead of that, instead of sort of coming together and, you know, diffusing the situation, they actually just decided, well, we're not going to, we're going to take the easy way out. We're going to cure him. Now, they did cure him, but I want to tell you, it looked like it hurt a lot. And again, throughout the rest of the series, John has a series of tragic adventures, saving some of his remaining loved ones from hell and committing others to it. Uh, he takes many trips to hell and aids in the rise and the fall of some of the biggest lords of hell, and he even blackmails God himself into getting out of a bind. Once in hell, he actually even came face with the demon John Constantine, whom he ended up, he had actually created by trying to get rid of all sort of the bad parts of himself in hopes of becoming a better person. Of course, creating this demon would come back to bite him in the end. One constant through the series, character-wise, is his niece, Gemma. Now, she's one of the only family members to really make it through the series, and she makes frequent appearances uh, throughout the comic run. And her, like John, she ages and matures through the comic. When we first meet her, she's probably like 11, and at the end of the book, around issue 300, she's probably in her, I would say, late 20s. Now, um, her uncle tries to shield her from magic, but she's a Constantine, and it runs in her blood. And so she dabbles with the dark arts from time to time, usually with tragic consequences. Sometimes she's really into trying to work with magic. At one point, she realizes it has done nothing but harm her life. Her uncle is toxic, and she, has, she wants nothing to do with it. Unfortunately, this does not last, and in the last few episodes of the book, her character really has serious, serious uh, uh, repercussions to John. Now, in a few of the last you know, story arcs, John actually falls in love with a young girl named uh, Epiphany. 
And uh, she's a daughter of a gangster. And, of course, that person has it out for John. And things, you know, things are really going really downhill in these last few arcs for John. You know, the age is showing on him. Maybe that's also because he's, he's, he's married to this young, young woman. He's having some really problems with, with uh, Gemma, who... See, this is where the demon John Constantine thing comes back to bite him. At uh, John's wedding... Uh, Gemma is there and the demon John Constantine uh, Tyne uh, corners her and sexually assaults her and she does not know about this demon and she thinks it's John so she has it out for John and she hires some witches to help her you know destroy her uncle and you know Graves is after him uh, Epiphany's dad so uh, he actually dies but it was a fake death and he comes back. Uh, but then, you know, uh, it all ends with Gemma. Uh, and uh, she has this magical dart, this revolver. And John says, you know, you've got to do what you got to do. And, you know, her words are, damn you, John Constantine. And she pulls the trigger. And this is where things get really, you know, I don't want to I don't know if the word controversial is too, too strong. But in the last issue, and I've actually got the book right in front of me and I'm looking at it, she fires the revolver with this magical dart in it. And I'm just going to talk about the last few pages. So she says, you know, damn you, John Constantine. Then there's a blank frame. And then she opens her eyes and it says she's saying uncle. And she looks surprised. And then the next page is the dart flying just on a white page. It doesn't show it hitting anything. And then there's like a big flash of light, and he's gone. Then it sort of goes through some pages of some scenes. And then uh, you're on another scene. You see Liverpool 15. It's a street. You see some people on the street. And this one girl is looking right at us, and she looks stunned. Um, Then we see a cat who, again, is looking right at us. Its, Its back is hunched. So what are these people seeing? And as we walk down the street... We're taken to a bar, which is aptly uh, called the journeys, uh, the long journey's end. The door opens. It's a warm, inviting environment. And there we see John Constantine, visibly older, uh, very sort of craggly kind of face, this vacant stare looking right at us. He's holding a pint. He doesn't have the, you know, the trench coat and all that. He's got this little cap on you would think is maybe an, an older English person wearing and all around him it's really interesting there are um, you know artists and writers and people who've been a part of the book are drawn in and on all the bottles behind him are all the different names of different artists and creators and editors but you know the thing was what and it's big the end at the bottom and there's there'll be an image of this in the show notes you know the thing everyone had a problem with was well, what happened I mean did did the dart send him to like, did he decide I'm going to save everybody and do one selfless act and get sent to maybe like a little pocket universe and live out my life in this bar? Or did he just disappear and do the, you know, truly, you know, uh, selfless thing and just live in a little flat somewhere and go to this bar and drink every night and become a pensioner and, and just sort of live out his days that way you know I don't know it's almost like um, it reminds me of um, The Sopranos where everybody was just supremely pissed off at that ending like what happened and I kind of go along with well what did you want to happen do we want to see him get ripped apart do we want to see I'm talking about John now I'm sorry do we want to see him get ripped apart do we want to see him like do one big glass magical battle and flip off the bad guy Um, what do we want to see and I think this, uh, you know, at first I didn't care for it, but looking back through it, I really like it because it really harkens back to that old Vertigo sort of style where, you know, you were left with questions and you didn't, you didn't know exactly maybe what happened. Um, and it was a little Twilight Zone business going on in there. And his face is so haunting in that panel and the coloring is so nicely done. It's, 
it's this warm sort of convivial place and these people are talking and having fun and here he is looking blank and sullen and and almost scared and it's just really uh, there's a really good there's a really good tension in this last panel again it'll be in the show notes and of course this was bittersweet because we knew that um yes that the book ended in issue 300 but that we knew that john was going to sort of bounce back and and be drawn into the main dcu shortly thereafter And now a word from our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. That's right, dcbservice.com, where all your books are 40 to 50% off, sometimes 75% off. Now, you can go to their site and just order them off their site, or you can do what I do. I download an Excel sheet. I actually order the previous catalog from DCB Service, and uh, then I just go through and I pick what I want, and I put it on the Excel sheet. I upload it, and I pay for them. Then they're mailed to me uh, each month. Now, you can have them mailed to you twice a week if you want. And I thought this would be apropos to today's podcast. Uh, Right now on the site for October, they've got Vertigo and Young Animal Bundles all 50% off. So let's take a look at what those include. I just clicked on the link on their site over at dcbservice.com. You can get the shade, the changing girl, 50% off uh, by Gerard Way. Uh, There are... Uh, a bundle with pretty much all the Vertigo titles in there. You can get, let's click on this one, the October 2016 Vertigo Bundle Discount Special. And that includes Astro City, Lost Boys, Ever After, Frostbite, Clean Room, Unfollow, and Lucifer. All those, that bundle, 50% off. Or, Or you can just get the individual issues for 50% off. So go over and check it out, dcbservice.com, all your comics, 50 or 40 to 50, sometimes 75% off. Just an amazing service. So with the titles and at 300, you know, we knew that there was going to be a relaunch with the whole new 52. And with the cancellation of the Vertigo imprint, you know, John was actually brought into the mainstream of comics. And this was, of course, really off-putting for quite a few people, including myself. Uh, I wasn't ready to see him with, you know, Superman and Batman and all these people. I was worried it would take the edge out of the book. And I have to say it did to a point. Obviously, we're not going to see some of the things we would see in a Vertigo title, a mature reader's title, in the pages of you know, that, you know, Batman or whatever, you know, series he was going to be in. But um, I was, of course, going to buy it because I'm, you know, a huge Constantine fan and I wanted to read the books. But what really sold me on it was that uh, when I saw who was writing it, it was uh, Jeff Lemire with Ray Falks. Uh, Jeff Lemire being one of the, you know, the main writers of the title. And he is one of my favorite writers. Uh, If you're unfamiliar with him, You know, take a look. He does amazing jobs at world building and character development. Uh, I probably start right off the bat with his uh, Essex Essex County trade. It's a big, thick omnibus. Uh, Or you can go with uh, Underwater Welder. That's another just amazing uh, title. He's just, yeah, he's a fantastic writer. So I gave it a chance because of these these two. And uh, I was really impressed with it. I I enjoyed it. They obviously did change a bunch of things. most notably was that John was quite a bit younger. He didn't quite seem, he didn't have a sister, at least they never mentioned it. Um, and his first magical spell was uh, actually set his house on fire, his childhood house on fire, and uh, killed his family, uh, including his mother. So it's really kind of shown that his mother didn't uh, die in childbirth. So there was, a, there was some marked changes, uh, some newer bad guys, um, the Cold Flame, which is sort of uh, comes from uh, hearing in some of the other books, and of course in um, the Books of Magic's title. And you know, this was a pretty good series, and it, it had, you know, of course, ended when um, the whole 52 thing, uh, before the whole 52 restart, but uh, it ended, and then they came out with another one, another number one, Constantine the Hellblazer. And uh, this was written by Doyle. And uh, drawn, just the yeah, drawing is amazing. Uh, Riley 
uh, I want to say it's Rosmo, that's how you pronounce it, it's hard to say some of these names, and the art in it is just incredible. I had a chance to meet him at a, uh, I believe it was at the New York Comic Con last year, and he did a uh, amazing sketch for me, I'll put it in the show notes of John Constantine, and uh, this title was really, um, it was really interesting, it was a lot darker, even though it was a DC book, it was a lot darker than the Jeff Lemire title. Um, he, you know, in this title, John has his ghosts back, and you know he is actively hitting on uh, uh, a young, handsome bartender uh, who uh, has two kids. He's a father of two kids, so we sort of reestablish the the fact that John's bisexual. Um, the bad guys are a bit scarier in this one. Uh, the the story gets a little loose in it, and uh, you know I should, probably shouldn't go into review, but uh, the first uh, arc of it I thought was pretty good, but then it sort of came apart. And here they they sort of keep the 52 continuity going with John, uh, and they don't really get too deep into his backstory. But those were the two newest things out until, of course, Rebirth. And again, I'm holding that in front of me, and um, they, of course rebirthed him like they did the whole DCU. Now, I haven't had a chance to read these yet, so I do not know where sort of the character is landing, how dark they're going to make it, and how much of the old character they're going to keep. He does look, at least on the cover, I'm flipping through some of the pages, he does look like he's still probably about 30, so they did 35, so they did de-age him, uh, and they're going to probably keep him here uh, like they do with most uh, comic titles. But uh, I'm looking forward to reading that. So this has been uh, probably one of the... I really had fun with this one, this podcast, because like I said, John's one of my favorite characters uh, for a couple reasons. I mean, one of the things is I remember reading him in high school, picking these books off the shelves. And I mean, I didn't talk about it much, but the book had just some amazing creators. Um, I mean, just some of the writers. This is a short list of writers um, through like sort of the main series. Of course, Jamie Delano, Grant Morrison, Neil Gaiman, Jamie Delano back, Garth Innes, Eddie Campbell, uh, Paul Jenkins, Warren Ellis. Those were amazing. Uh, Brian Azzarello. I mean, Mike Carey, Jason Aaron, Andy Diggle. These were... I mean, just incredible, incredible writers and uh, cover artists. These were some of the most incredible covers. Dave McKean, who did all the Sandman covers. Kent Williams, David Lloyd, Sean Phillips, Glenn Farby. Those are amazing. Tim Bradstreet's uh, covers are amazing. Simon Bisley. I wish they'd do like a cover book. Just some incredible, incredible artists out there. Artists interiors. You had David Lloyd, Sean Phillips, who had some amazing runs. Steve, uh, the late Steve Dillon, David Lloyd, uh, Peter Schneinberg. Again, I, I am sure I pronounced that wrong. Uh, Charles Adler from, uh, from The Walking Dead. Tim Bradstreet. Just incredible, incredible. And the list goes on. Simon Bisley, Jock. I mean, you could just, just look at all the different art. When a book's got 300 issues to it, um, they really, you know, they really didn't hold back on getting some amazing people into this book. And, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the films because, of course, this is one of those those characters that have uh, had their own movies and television show. So the, the film, Constantine, came out in 2005, and John was portrayed by Keanu Reeves. And, of course, everybody, you know, the Internet had a you know, unified freakout because he's American and he doesn't look anything like Constantine. I, of course, had the same reaction. The storyline's taken from Garth Innes' Dangerous Habits story arc. Uh, you know, it's got Papa Midnight, and it's got some from Original Sins. And, they, you know, they've changed, of course, several aspects of the character. But, you know, I have to say that I enjoyed this movie. The person who is playing uh, the devil is amazing. Tilda Swinson is in it as an angel. It is just, a, I think it's a creepy movie, and I, I really, I liked it. I love the ending. You know, this is one of those ones where, you know, you either, if you're a Constantine fan, you either love it or hate it. I think if you're a, uh, just a movie fan, you'd like it because it's a really cool sort of creepy supernatural slash horror movie. Um, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think I'm actually going to watch it this weekend. 
And of course, the latest sort of screen debut of Constantine was his TV show on NBC. Now, I was sad to see that this was going to be on NBC because I didn't think they'd be able to really keep it going and give that sort of um, grit that the character needed. I wish it had been on CW like a lot of the other comic book shows. Um, now, it starred an actor, uh, Matt Ryan. He's Welsh. And he, man, he looked just like Constantine. He really, really uh, the part played the part very well. And, you know, uh, Supernatural Mysteries, Demons, I mean, Chaz was in it. Um, it took place in America, which was strange. Uh, but overall, I really liked it. I think it kept some of the creepiness in it, and it um, it had some dark moments, and the guy did a really good job of it. I would have liked to see where they could go with it. Of course, it was canceled, and uh, there was actually, though, a crossover uh, on uh, CW on Arrow, where Ryan um, sort of reprised the role of Constantine in a little guest, starred, uh, guest starring episode with Oliver Queen. And people were really hoping that he would come over to the CW, but it, of course, never happened. So this character has been around since the early 80s. A uh, huge run in comics, its own, his own movie, his own television program. Um, there's, of course, uh, word out that there's going to be an animated Justice League Dark movie, perhaps, that, of course, John Constantine leads. We didn't get a chance to talk about that. This podcast could be an hour long if we went over every aspect. It could be hours long. Um, but I will leave some uh, issues and some things you might want to check out in the show notes. Uh, right off the top of my head, of course, would be maybe the first three trades. Uh, I definitely check out the the first appearance in Swamp Thing. Uh, one of the other amazing John Constantine reads that we didn't talk about is the Books of Magic uh, four piece series that Neil Gaiman wrote, where the Trench Coat Brigade, John Constantine being one of them, helps a young Timothy Hunter try to decide whether or not he wants to get into magic. It is probably one of the most perfect four issues in all comics. So that is the Books of Magic. The other things I might say to read are um, some of the, the the Warren Ellis run. That was pretty incredible. The Tim Bradstreet run. Again, these trades can be picked up relatively inexpensively, or you can pick up the digital downloads. Either way, if you really want to read something interesting and dark and and mysterious and with a really complex character uh i really you know check out john constantine he again i can't say it enough he's my favorite character uh, i really hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast i had a really really fun time doing it uh take a look at the show notes to see uh, some of the recommended readings and some of the cool images that i've sort of pulled through the web to um that sort of talk about some of the things we've had on the on the cast today Well, I want to thank you again for listening to this week's episode of the Heroes, Villains, and Sidekicks show. Our theme music is by Broke for Free, and you can find links to other music from the show on our website, heroesvillainsandsidekicks.com. There you can listen to the show, or even better, go over to iTunes, subscribe, and please leave a review. We could really use some, and I would really appreciate it. And again, if you have any recommendations or any comments uh, on this week's podcast, go ahead over to the show and leave them in the post. Uh, I've sort of rearranged the site where, yes, you can listen to the show, of course, right on the homepage using the amazing sort of plugin that I purchased for that. Or you can go over to the blog where all the episodes are listed in blog format and post format. There's a player there. You can read the transcripts. You can also see any of the notes uh, and images I've sort of talked about during the cast and any of the recommended readings. So, uh, yeah, go over to the site, check it out. We're uh, always adding to it and and sort of updating it. And next week, I'm not sure who we're going to do. Maybe leave a comment over to the website and then I can get some more ideas. So we'll be back next week with more. Take care.